Let's jump back a bit before we continue forward. Now, last time I mentioned that Mega Man X6 was sort of, sort of my jump back into the mainline Mega Man X series. My reasoning for this jump, however, dates back to a game released for the Game Boy back in 2000. I was all over my Game Boy at the turn of the millennium. I always had a love for the portable brick, but the likes of Pokemon really made me enamored with the thing before the PlayStation 2 took all my time afterwards. As such, when I wasn't grinding my ass off to take care of the Elite Four, I was sifting through Toys R Us to see what else I can play for the thing, and that's when I caught eye of Mega Man Extreme. I thought to myself, hey, is this any good? You gotta remember, this was at a time when I still had my Super Nintendo, but my library was next to non-existent because of the family's focus on the PlayStation, so I couldn't revisit the SNES classic all wily nily and I was only 13, so getting a job was out of the question, I had to compromise, so I got Mega Man Extreme instead after saving up some money. I don't have my physical copy of the game anymore, but Extreme 1 and Extreme 2 are available on the 3DS Virtual Console for about 5 bucks a piece. But in a day and age where the Super Nintendo games are just as cheap, I feel the Extreme games have a little more to prove to justify the price, especially in Extreme 1's case where, uh, let's face it, it's just a watered down version of Mega Man X1 and X2. During a routine snooze, because I think that's what X is doing here, and he sleeps standing up, weirdo. Anyway, X finds himself waking up in familiar territory. After rummaging around the destroyed highway from Mega Man X, the blue bomber unexpectedly runs into Vile. Uh, sorry, Vava. That's his Japanese name, and it looks like they didn't bother translating it. X finishes off Vava Fett and learns from Zero that the Maverick Hunter mother computer has been hacked into. Someone or something is attempting to sabotage the Maverick Hunter's operation by bringing up battle data from the past and causing a ruckus from within the cyber network. With assistance from Maverick Hunter tech support, namely this one of the dude named Mitty, X is tasked with heading into cyberspace to deal with the issue at hand. What this basically amounts to is X revisiting half of Mega Man X1 and half of Mega Man X2, and even then you're only given access to four levels from the start. But it's not like Mega Man 8 where you do four stages, fight a midway boss, do the other four stages, then defeat the bad guy at the end. No, you only fight four Mavericks, then you face off against Sigma, because yeah, it's Sigma responsible for all this, of course, and then the credits roll. Extreme is a very bite-sized adventure, appropriate given its handheld nature, but you might be a little confused when things end after only about 30 minutes. That is until you're offered to try out the hard mode. Yeah, Extreme has what they classify as different difficulties, but it's not really in the traditional sense, just more of the adventure. Normal mode, for instance, has you face off against Chill Penguin, Spark Mandrel, Storm Eagle, and Flamestag. With hard mode, you can face off against the other four Mavericks, Wheel Gator, Magnus Centipede, Armin Armadillo, and Morph Moth. Not what I would really identify as a hard mode. You're no less ill-equipped for the adventure than previously, and you can start this mode with all of your save progress from normal, meaning you can begin this adventure with all the heart tanks, sub tanks, and armor parts you collected previously. And if you beat this mode, Mode, then you unlock extreme mode, and at this point, it's just a traditional Mega Man game. You have to go up against all eight Mavericks, and you're back to score one in terms of equipment, which is nothing you haven't done already if you played any Mega Man game before. And I feel that's the best way to describe Mega Man Extreme, it's nothing you haven't played before. Every level is taken from their Super Nintendo equivalent, though shrunken down a bit in some cases, like I don't think Storm Eagle or Wheel Gator are as big as before. This can make some levels feel lesser, but most of them are pretty much the same as you remember them, only in 8-bit. And as far as looks and sound go, Extreme isn't bad at all. If you ever wanted to hear 8-bit renditions of classic X songs, Extreme has you covered. They're a good listen, I find. And the overall sprite quality is about on par with the classic Mega Man games from the NES days. What the hell's with Sigma's head here, though? I swear he's just shy of giving me like a, a cat-like grin. What the hell is his face? But X is still capable of jumping, shooting, wall jumping, and dashing, but because of the Game Boy's limited button options, you have to rely on double tapping the D-pad forward to perform a dash. You get used to it, and it's better than the alternative where you can also hit the start button to dash, which is just... no, why? You can collect heart tanks to increase your health, sub tanks for emergency situations, and you can augment your armor for added defenses with special light capsules located in every stage. I really like how you can acquire both the Hadouken and the Shoryuken at the same time here. They're not as overpowered as previously, and the range on the Shoryuken could be a bit better. But now you don't have to be at full health to perform them, and in some situations, it's better than a normal charge shot. Sadly, you only have X for this adventure. Despite Zero being in the game, he's only available as these special attacks you can find in light capsules during hard mode and beyond. They can take a decent chunk of health off things in a pinch, but they're not as exciting as being able to play as the red guy normally and you can end up wasting them if you don't aim the attack properly. I gotta say, it feels good to use Storm Tornado again. I, I love this weapon, and the Rolling Shield was always one of my favorite defensive tools. I can use the same strategies to take care of Mavericks as before, they all have the same weaknesses and such. Yeah, Mega Man Extreme is faithful to the games it's based on, but there's really no reason to play this when the superior Mega Man X and X2 are just as easy to access nowadays. You get this for your collection, nothing much more to it than that, but to give it some credit, it was the game responsible for getting me back into the X series, because after this is when I started renting X6 all the damn time, which would eventually lead me to get in the X collection for the PS2. It did its job on reminding me on what I enjoy about the X series, even if the game itself is not original in the slightest. Extreme 2, on the other hand, I wouldn't play until this very video. By the time Extreme 2 came out physically, I think in July of 2001, I was already tied up with the PS2, and then later the Game Boy Advance would come out and take all my time. It fell under my radar, basically, and, but now I got to finally see what I've been missing. 
Across the world, Repwoods are becoming hollow shells, a result of their DNA souls being ripped straight out of their bodies. X and Zero are sent to Lagoo's Island to investigate the situation, with support from the newly recruited member of Repliforce, Iris, canonically making her first appearance. Yeah, Extreme 1 and 2 are technically canon to the X series, Extreme 1 being set between X2 and 3, with Extreme 2 being set between X3 and X4. I know it was probably asking for too much, but I thought Extreme 2 would try and maybe flesh out the relationship between Zero and Iris, you know, since this is the first time they work together and all that, but it doesn't amount to anything sadly. Iris is mission control, that's about it, even less significant than her X4 appearance. But hey, if you enjoyed her presence in X4, I'm sure this is a welcome surprise to see her back. X and Zero learn that the ones responsible for this soul erasure is the combined efforts of this dude named Gareth and this lady named Burkana. And I just want to say, while these two aren't very interesting as far as villains go, they're pretty one note, I love Burkana's design. We don't get many female villains in the X series, or all of Man now that I think about it, but this is a damn good design. It's the witch attire, I'm a sucker for that sort of shit. Anywho, Gareth and Burkana yearn to use the stolen DNA souls to to increase their power and uh, take over the world, I guess. They don't really extend much beyond that, and in the end, it's really Sigma who's behind the whole thing, unsurprisingly. I mean, Gareth and Burkana are still evil and need to be stopped, but they're really extensions of Sigma's plan, which is a bit disappointing, but again, not unexpected. So this whole thing with DNA souls and such is this game's excuse to resurrect Mavericks from past games, as Gareth wants to build an army for his own ambitions, and with the collected souls, he can bring old Mavericks back from the dead. Sounds like something you'd see out of a Halloween episode of Mega Man X. Maybe the old Mavericks are these mindless husks that crave for blood and brains, or maybe the whole game would have this dark and eerie overtone to it. I think that'd be interesting, honestly, but nah. The returning Mavericks are about the same as they were before, so nothing's drastically different here. What is different, though, are the stages themselves. Unlike Extreme 1, Extreme 2 has some radically different level design for all the returning bosses. I like to compare it to Sonic Pocket Adventure, where the aesthetics are familiar, but the gimmicks and all that are different. To use Volt Catfish as an example, he has a few things from his original stage, but now he's taken a page from Toxic Seahorse, along with water currents that can either push you back or instantly kill you if they have an electric current. Extreme 2 is a little weird with the one-hit kill consistency, like the water will sometimes one-shot you, other times it doesn't, the magma flow in later stages is not a one-hit kill, surprisingly, it just hurts, and these fireballs in Flame Mammoth stage can't make up their goddamn mind, they either one-shot me or they don't, I don't understand why that is, is it a difficult thing? Is it because I'm in extreme mode? This is the only obstacle to change under those conditions, so what's up with that? There's still a degree of familiarity with some levels, just to make that clear, but this alone makes Extreme 2 feel more unique than Extreme 1, and now you can play as both X and Zero this time around. Zero is once again about close quarters combat and utilizing special techniques you can acquire from defeated bosses. If you played the PS1 games, you should have an idea of what you're getting into, but if you ask me, this is a bit of a downgrade. While Zero can dish out the pain, his range is pathetic. Too often I find myself taking collision damage because I have to get closer than usual to enemies to take them out. This becomes less of an issue when I find armor upgrades to increase my defense and increase the power of my saber, but early game with Zero can be borderline irritating. Like, I'm glad he's here, but it can be a little rough. Like X5, I find the game better with X, given that he can take care of many problems from a distance. But a cool thing with Extreme 2 as you progress is that you eventually get the ability to switch between X and Zero on the fly with the push of a button. Now, I ended up using X for the majority of my playtime because, again, Zero takes some patience to work with. This is basically like having two health bars and grateful when you need a certain strategy against the boss because, man, against this asshole, you need that sort of shit. Seriously, fuck this guy. Who designed this dickhead? The guys who made Mega Man in base? But if switching between both heroes wasn't good enough for you, there's also the parts you can buy in the shop. You know, I'm surprised it took me this long to wonder why the part system in X5 and X6 weren't handled like the upgrades in Mega Man 8. It makes perfect sense for this kind of game. Like, this is how parts should have been handled from the get-go, so major kudos to Extreme 2 for handling it this way. So the DNA souls are not just a story thing, they're also something you can collect in-game, and every enemy drops them. They not only act as energy and ammo pickups, but they're also currency for parts you can buy from Iris. Stronger shots, increased invincibility frames, hell, if you collect enough souls, you can also just straight up buy the complete set of armor upgrades if you don't feel like hunting down light capsules. I don't think they're that taxing to find. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think you need to have the full set of armor this time to even finish the game. Some of the level design in the final area requires things like the air dash to get across obstacles, which is normally never the case and kind of falls into X6 level of bullshit, just not as severe. So take it from me, go after those light capsules and save those DNA souls for other stuff because fuck me if some of these aren't ridiculous. I just want to say this right now, I have no idea what kind of utility the other weapons have. I mean, I did use some of them for Maverick weaknesses, but once I upgraded the power of my default weapon, I'm not kidding here, that was all I needed. Yep, even against bosses, the damage output was insane for both characters and with the right combination of parts, specifically with X, you can become an unstoppable killing machine. Give it a try, both of the buster upgrades with ultimate buster and speed shot and turn on the rapid fire mode in the options menu, Jesus, nothing can stop you, not even 
and Sigma. Extreme 2 is split between two missions, one with X and one with Zero. Each of them have their own set of bosses to take care of while returning from X1, X2, and now we got some X3 bosses thrown into the fray. And though X and Zero's scenarios both have their beginning, middle, and end with Gareth and Burkana acting as the final bosses, the true final boss, Sigma, can only be taken down by completing the game's extreme mode, unlocked by completing both missions where, once again, you have to face against all eight Mavericks instead of just four, like a traditional Mega Man X game. If you're playing extreme mode, then once again, you have to consider which character gets hard tanks and all that since they aren't shared like an X5. But thankfully, it is impossible to lose Zero this time because of shitty luck, so don't worry if you decide to just stick to one character. If I ever go back to Extreme 2, I think I'll just jump straight into Extreme mode since I see no point in playing the previous missions when this is just the two combined, plus an extra boss. Extreme 2 is easily better than Extreme 1. I'm not saying that Extreme 1 isn't worth its $5 price tag, but Extreme 2 has way more bang for its buck and offers more than just being a rehash. I mean, it still reuses Mavericks and has a similar look and feel to the SNES games, but level design is more original, the part system is better implemented here than in the console games I find, giving you an easy edge in combat, and having access to both X and Zero in real time makes gameplay more versatile, even if I do think Zero's Saber could be a bit longer. Once again, you can find these both on the 3DS Virtual Console for five bucks. Go and get them if you're looking for a nice little 8-bit distraction. But all right, I, I really gotta try and get these next videos done before October. These months come and go so fast. So I'm just gonna immediately head into the next game for the marathon. Mega Man X7 for the PlayStation 2. Well, it was originally PlayStation 2. I'm going to be looking at the Legacy Collection version for next time, and I hope, uh, hope we don't get any audio stuttering or lag. I, I doubt it, but you never know this sort of thing. But uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. As always, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.